A lot of times, some of the things we looked at as L's were things that were also things that were keeping us comfortable. Um, and so again, we had to, I, they had to be taken away because this is the only way I can get you to move into the real thing that I need you to be doing. So I, again, I, I looked at them as, okay, what was I supposed to be learning? Yeah, I'm mad in the moment. I'm human. Like, you know, you're, you're, you feel some type of way because it's not what you thought it was supposed to be. But, um, as, as you can see, what's for you will always find you, right? Like it always comes back around. And when it comes back around and when the timing is right, you're going to know you're going to have peace around that being this is the time, right? God mm -hmm. is going to make that make that very apparent. And, and this time around, it was right. It was what I needed to do. Because I think if, if I had gotten if I had gotten what I wanted at that time, I don't know if we would have been able to really um, do a lot of the things that we're doing now in terms of even the community being ready for it, right? Like, it's just not about me being excited and me having all these great ideas. The community has to be ready. The staff has to be ready. Your right. council people have to be ready. Everybody had, the time just has to be right. Welcome back to the Cosign Conversations podcast. You're probably wondering where the hell KG is at. He is here in the studio with us, but we have a very, very special guest. So when KG told me that he was going to be interviewing the mayor of DeSoto, I was like rambling on and on and on. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, she recently did this and you read that. He was like, why don't you just do the interview? And I'm like, Gladly. So that is why I'm here. I am Emily Della Cruz. I am the CMO of Cosign Magazine, and I help KG and the team do all of the things behind the scenes to get the word out to you guys. So today we have a very, very special guest, Mayor Rachel, and she is here for two reasons. We want to know a lot about her life as a public servant, entrepreneur, but she is also the honoree of this year's Cosign Award. So we are very excited to highlight her and learn her story. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I am so uh, geeked out right now because you have been my friend in my head for like a long time. So oh it's so God. good to connect with you here on the podcast. Yes. And it's so crazy because I when I first moved to Dallas, so I've been in Dallas for three years. I'm originally from New York City, uh, but I lived in Atlanta for five years. So when I moved to Dallas, I asked everybody, I'm like, so where are the black people? And they were like, <laughs> DeSoto, South Dallas, exactly. Cedar Hill, you know, because I was like, we, I can't come from like the black Mecca of Atlanta yeah. to then be in some fool over here. So they were like, you know, you should check out DeSoto, whatever. I ended up moving to South Dallas. Um, but I started watching this YouTube video of like the top 10 cities in Texas mm -hmm. for black people. And DeSoto was number one. So my hairstylist is in DeSoto. My midwife was in DeSoto. And I remember I was driving to DeSoto and I would see like the, you know, your campaign billboards. And I was like, who is this dope black woman? <laughs> so I started following you, not a resident of DeSoto at all, um, but I started following you in your journey and kind of really uh, was admiring how you're able to just like juggle so many things. Yeah. But I know that uh, the person that we see before us today isn't who you've always been, right? Yeah. So kind of walk us through like your journey, being a second generation entrepreneur. You know, I know you, you haven't worked in corporate, like having businesses and really taking a non-traditional path, if you will. Yeah. Um, wow. That's a lot to unpack. <laughs> but um, I, it's so it's so interesting. I think about my story all the time in terms of how I grew up. My dad, he was a pastor and a businessman. And I can remember being like 12 years old in the corner of my dad's office learning how to make a payroll. And so, like you mentioned, I've never worked in corporate. I think, though, that our destiny will leave us clues. I can remember being like five or six years mm -hmm. old. And I don't even know where I got the idea from, but I remember taking my mom's old hangers she would get from the dry cleaners and like taking them. And then I would take string and cut little like shapes and animals out of notebook paper. And I would make these hanging mobiles like that you put over a baby's bed, mm -hmm. like the little, well, they don't do it anymore, but. It would like be these mobiles. Um, and literally, I was the youngest. We had no babies in the house. I don't know who, but I ended up making a catalog and everything. And so uh, I was selling to my siblings and to my mom. And that was about <laughs> it. That's about as far as I got. But I think even with entrepreneurship and all those things, it just leaves you clues in terms of where mm -hmm. you're supposed to land. And so I've just been, I, I honestly say I've been blessed to be able to have a front row seat to that. Again, growing up in ministry, which um, just being servants, right? That's, that's one of the things that we were 
were taught um, to do, but also being able to work hard in our family's businesses and learning a lot of lessons the hard way. That's why I tell entrepreneurs all the time, I can tell you what to do, but most of all, I can tell you what not to do because <laughs> mm -hmm. I did all the learning for you. So it's been it's been a journey. Yeah. Would you uh, share some of the businesses that you are currently involved in and kind of like the businesses that you saw growing up? Certainly. So my family uh, has a business. We have a, a child care center in Oak Cliff and we have that's that business has actually been in our family for almost 30 years now. My dad mm -hmm. started that business uh, when we moved to the uh, to to Oak Cliff. So we're in the Ledbetter Glendale area over there. Um, our, people always know our, bu our, our building where we are because we used to be the old Bonanza Steakhouse is the building we were in. When we moved in, there was still wagon wheels and everything <laughs> on this building. So we we've kind of obviously over over the years retro fitted that building for our center. We've been uh, in partnership with Dallas ISD for about 15 years now with our center. So we serve as an offsite campus for pre-K there. But also I've had other businesses myself. I do a lot of business consulting, things of that nature. I also used to do real estate management. Mm -hmm. That was one of the first businesses I'll say that I kind of just journeyed out there on my own um, to do. But as of right now, I'm taking on probably one of the Biggest projects I've done on my own in terms of just as a businesswoman, um, and that is I actually have gotten, I'm a franchisee for Salada Salad Kitchen. Yeah. So I actually have an area development agreement for three locations we're going to start with. Um, one of the things that actually, people are like, why'd you, that's like a random pivot, like where'd that come from? But actually, I've always wanted to have a healthy food concept um, just as a lifestyle for me. I'm really big on that. Um, and so, you know, in probably 2017-ish, I kind of got the itch to really start looking into it and I actually thought about doing my own concept and I had reached out to several restaurant concept development firms things of that nature and uh, landed on just doing a franchise I said well let me see what brands are out there and so it, it took a while to get there but this was the year I was like the timing was right um, the opportunity was right. The need is there. The need right. is greater than ever because even in the southern sector of Dallas, if you know anything about our area, healthy options are mm -hmm. almost obsolete. They're, they just don't exist. And yeah. so I wanted to be able to be a part of the solution versus being online complaining about what we don't have. Mm -hmm. Be one of those people that can use their resources and things of that nature and put their money where their mouth is and be able to bring those options to our community. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I live in South Dallas and it's like, what we got over there? Williams Chicken, uh, you know, Little Mama's Barbecue. Like, there's literally no healthy options. It's essentially a food desert, really. Yeah. So now that you've become kind of like a franchisee in this kind of space, do you feel like it's hard to balance, you know, being a franchisee and having a family business and, you know, having your own online presence and being a mayor? Mm -hmm. Like... You know, how do those things compete? Like That how do sounds you like a lot when hearing it, somebody else say all the <laughs> things that are going on in my life right now. But I would say, Emily, the biggest thing is you have to know what season of life you're in. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, what helps me to be able to juggle it, and I won't say that it, it doesn't, uh, it's not a lot because it is. It absolutely mm -hmm. is. But I will say that this is a season where I think I've been graced to handle it because the timing is right. So like with my family business, again, it's been in our business, I mean, in our family for almost 30 years. My sister and I took over as owners in two. 2009. So we've had that business. So we're really almost absentee owners at this point in terms mm -hmm. of our school. We've trained, we've had incredible staff there that work and support, um, support the mm -hmm. business for us. So I'm not as hands-on in the day-to-day -day since we've given mm -hmm. that off to, um, to a director and she runs that for us. So I'm not as hands-on there. Um, I still do some of the administrative work, but even with um, becoming mayor, people feel like I'm down there running the day-to-day -day of the city. And that's just not, tip well, in most cities, that's not the job of the mayor. You have some cities that a strong mayor and they have other responsibilities. But for most cities um, like DeSoto, we're not running the day to day. We are strictly the governing and legislative policy making body of the city. Um, I'm also as the mayor, I'm the spokesperson of the city. Right. So I'm the face of the city. In the community, but I've learned that whatever you do, do only what you can do. So, like, I used to be a control freak, I'm, and I, I won't tell you I don't dab my toe over into it every every now and then, but I've learned to really delegate and to really help people to uh, put people in the areas where they're strongest at, and then I do stick to what I do best. And when I stick to only what I can do in those instances, it really makes it not as hectic because I'm not trying to do all the things. Yeah. Would you consider being the mayor kind of like being the CEO of a city? 
Somewhat. So I will say the the CEO technically would be our city manager because he okay. is the one down there kind of making some of those decisions. However, um, when you look at kind of the hierarchy or org chart, if you will, of a city, the residents are at the very top. So all of us, no matter where we are in line, we have to answer to our residents. The mm -hmm. residents then elect us as the body. So yeah. we're there. The city council um, hires the city manager. So he's our employee. Mm -hmm. So basically, we set the vision. We set the tone for progress, whatever we yeah. want to see in our community. Because ultimately, So you're kind of like a board, if yeah, you will, like a board of Essentially a board. So we're the board. Okay. And yeah. then the, the CEO would be our city manager. He's gotcha. our employee. He reports to us. And then his staff is underneath him. that reports to him. Okay. Yeah. So you have a business that you're hands off on. You have the city, now your franchisee. It's giving leadership. It's giving, <laughs> I know how to delegate, right? And I think as entrepreneurs, especially a lot of y'all watching, that's the biggest thing that we struggle with, right? It's like, we don't have money, so we can't market. We have to be the face of our business. We don't know how to delegate. Nobody could do it as good as us. Nobody knows how to do it like us, right? Mm -hmm. So especially if you're like a control freak, right? So how do you develop your leadership skills? What do you think makes a great leader and how do you um, implement that in different areas? You know what? I would say for me, and just kind of sitting here thinking as you're speaking, I think for me, I didn't get to all those things overnight, right? Mm -hmm. Like I said, me and my sister, that business has been in our family for 30 years. I grew up seeing that. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't ready to take over ownership in 2009 you know, when I was 12 years old, making, you know, yeah. watching my dad, like it, I had to grow into those things and mm -hmm. be very, my word for this year is intentional, right? Mm -hmm. I had to be very intentional about what I saw for my life, mm -hmm. but also not just, you know, saying, okay, this is what I want to do. And then just haphazardly finding, figuring it out on the way down. I think right. with a lot of cliches, we we tell ourselves as entrepreneurs and just as people in general, a lot of motivational quotes really get us in trouble. Like, oh, okay, just, you know, jump and build a plane on the way down. Yeah, maybe, but not so much, right? Like you do have to really be intentional. Now, I will say that some of the things that have really pivoted my life in terms of um, things that I know were destiny moves in my life, as much as I do plan and as much as I stand, I stand on that. I, I'm 10 toes down with you need to plan, you need to be intentional. And um, But there have been some things that have been more instinctive than they have been intentional. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is even the fact that I'm serving as mayor today was more instinctive than it was intentional. Believe it or not, my family, we were not a political family. Like I said, my dad was a pastor. He was a businessman. We didn't talk about politics at all in our home. Jesus was our president for all I knew. Like we just didn't, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't talked about. So I didn't see anybody do that. So it wasn't like I was aspiring to something that I was seeing, right? I had no frame of reference for politics. Um, and so for me, I think, um, but it all, I think there are all common themes that run through it all though. Like with, with leadership, with service, all of it kind of goes back and, and rises and falls on those, those aspects. Yeah. When you, I was cracking up because when you were talking about Jesus as my president, <laughs> <laughs> girl, yes, because you know, the, the state of politics now is, it's, it's in crazy. an interesting place, right? Because we have a lot more women, a lot more young people, a lot more people of color, like jumping into politics, yeah. but it's not something that we grew up seeing. And one thing I really admire about you is like, you're very accessible, right? So prior to like oh, the Obama administration or like even like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, mm -hmm even President Trump, like being so connected and being able to like easily access our public officials wasn't a thing. So yeah. as you navigate like social media, what are some of the things that you kind of have to, you know, take into consideration when you're trying to, of course, move forward your own business, but also, you know, you have such a, a, a constituency that's looking at you. I think it's, it's, it is a, it is a, is it is it is an art and a science, mm -hmm. right? Um, because you want your constituents and the people that elected you to represent them to feel like you are accessible, and I think that that sometimes is the issue with why politics, you know, gets such a bad rep at times with with people they don't feel like they have access. Mm -hmm. And for me, the city hall is the people that belongs to the people, right? So. 
you should feel like you can come to your elected officials with whatever concerns, how big or how small, whatever that is, um, and be able to get a response, be able to get answers, mm -hmm. be able to um, just get an understanding of what's really going on. Because I always say the decisions that we make as elected officials are the ones our constituents have to live with. So we need to make sure that we're mm -hmm. including that feedback. We need to make sure we're listening to people. And so... Um, for me, it, it is somewhat of a balance because you do, a, a lot of people think I don't have a personal life because all they see is business <laughs> or mayor or all of that. But um, for me, I, I really believe my personal life is very sacred to me mm -hmm. because I know how politics is. I know how business is. I know how how people can be right and right. so I don't my family didn't sign up for that. So right. I don't like to expose my family to a degree. I mean, you know, people know some some to some degree who my family is but I don't like to expose my family to to a lot of things just because I care about them and I don't want them to be you know at the at the receiving end of anything that I signed up for mm -hmm. so I don't share a lot of my personal life on on social media that's why people are like do you go out you need to take some time for yourself I'm like honey I'm over here living y'all just don't <laughs> even know um but it is uh, to but but people want to feel like they know you right and mm -hmm. so that's why I said it is kind of an art and it is, it is a science and if you know anything about me, the residents of DeSoto, I am always, um, I try to be as much as I can uh, at things, right? Like right, social yeah. media is one thing, but actually being there live and in person and among the people is huge for me. Yeah, um, and I, I sure. love that piece of it. Yeah, I crack up because on social media, I'm like, she's always at the function. She's always at a game. <laughs> she here, she there. There's literally nothing that like is goes un like detected on your radar when it comes to DeSoto. It's like, okay, the football team is doing this. We over here, we over there. Um, and I know like you have done like partnerships with like the small business uh, administration. Mm -hmm. um, there's the the food hall that I actually saw you reposted a video of somebody like doing a review. I'm like, nothing gets past me or Rachel, honey, okay? <laughs> she is on the pulse. So how do you kind of um, view entrepreneurship like uh and and supporting creatives i know that that's like a big part of you know your your personal brand and, and your yeah. mission but in general what do you think are some ways that supporting entrepreneurs really not only develops a city but develops oh, to absolutely. me you know the nation absolutely that's uh it's huge for me because again that's my lifestyle it's it's all i really know like i don't even know I'm like, if I try to go to corporate, I don't know who gonna hire me because I'm just, <laughs> I just don't, I don't, I don't have no frame of reference for corporate America. So I love entrepreneurs. I understand what entrepreneurs go through to the very, down to the very cellular level of what we deal with as entrepreneurs. And so when you mentioned the Grow to Soda Marketplace, I was actually one of the original uh, folks on that team that created that concept. So what happened, it, it used to be an old Ace Hardware building and they Ace Hardware either went out of business or whatever happened. So it's uh, it was just, it was vacant. And so we talked to the, to the shopping strip owner at the time and they were getting ready to sign a lease with a dollar store for that space. And like, you know, nothing against dollar stores. I love dollar stores, but we just didn't think that was the highest and best use of right, that space. Right. We probably would have been home of the biggest dollar store in the nation because <laughs> that <laughs> building is like over 20,000 square feet or something like that. So it would have been huge um, and, and not necessarily really, um, you know, something that our community was wanting. So how right. could we really utilize that space in a creative way um, that really, again, help to provide a benefit to the residents? Now, one thing about DeSoto, we have some of the, uh, from from small to large to just whatever, in terms of entrepreneurs in our community, I won't start name dropping, but they're there. Um, Dro drop them, know. girl, drop them. <laughs> Let us know. But, but um, <laughs> you know, they're there, but there's a real entrepreneurial spirit in DeSoto. Mm -hmm. So what we saw was that we had, um, a lot of business owners that were catering out of their homes or just making things or, you know, had candles, making soap, um, T-shirts, just whatever. Um, and people were really wanting to get into the restaurant space, things of that nature but really didn't have the resources, the capital, all the things you need to start a business. So that's how we came up with the Grow to Soda Marketplace because we were already envisioning redeveloping our corridor to kind of create a downtown experience and really creating an identity for DeSoto. But I think that creating an identity does not come with big box chain restaurants, right. your, your TGI Fridays and your Applebee's, right? Like we have people that can develop and create restaurants and experiences um, that are unique to our community and, right. and have those people that are living in our community be able to work and, and build wealth in our community through this. So that's kind of how the Grow to Soto Marketplace was born. So when I saw the um, 
when I saw the food review and all the things um, that were going on around that, I was I felt like a proud mama because that was exactly the point is to be able to provide this space at low and lower lower cost rents. Um, they don't have to come in and you know purchase all the equipment and things. So. Even if at the end of the time that they're there, they realize, hey, maybe this is not for me. They're not out of as much uh, as they would be if they tried to go out and do something on their own. So they're right. there with that support and that business support for them. So that really takes a lot of vision, right? To see a 20,000 foot space and think like, you know, we could do something more. But I know that with entrepreneurship, oftentimes it's like getting that opportunity right, get having a partner, having some sort of collaboration. So for you, how important has it been kind of like developing those things uh, throughout your career in entrepreneurship? So developing partnerships, I think, is is going to be key. I would say, and, and even more so than partnerships per se, but developing relationships. I have right. this saying, and I always say, progress moves at the speed of relationships. Mm. So you have to kind of get out of our silos. I think for some entrepreneurs, especially for those people that start off kind of like as solo entrepreneurs, yeah. just really understanding the benefit and the importance of it is um, is important. Is, is key, you know, and I know for me, I'm naturally, and people don't believe it, but I'm naturally an introvert. Um, sometimes my social anxiety be on 10. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> let me, so it, I have to be again, very intentional about mm -hmm. how I go about building relationships. And one thing for me that I always say, even with it, not just even in business, but obviously in uh, my role as an elected official, creating touch points and figuring out who like come the, the stakeholders are that will help you to advance whatever your mission, whatever your vision is. It doesn't have to be anybody that you're speaking to all the time, but sometimes there are stakeholders that um, you, you, you need to keep a quarterly touch point or a monthly touch point, or some people are weekly, some are, are daily or however that is. Because one thing for me is, you don't want the only time you reach out to somebody is when you need something, yeah. right? So like figuring that out. And for me, it's been um, kind of almost just from a tactical standpoint, figuring out who those people are, writing down like, you know, what, how do they play into what you have going on um, and how can you serve them as well, right? So that it's, so that it's a win-win for everybody in terms of building those relationships and how can you make, um, make something in terms of creating space for that relationship that both of you all can benefit from. Yeah. With networking, it's a little, I would say, tricky sometimes yeah. because you don't know if people want to connect with you because they oh, want absolutely. something from you or because, you know, they genuinely want to, like, build a relationship. So how do you recommend being authentic and genuine? Right. Because we got a whole bunch of entrepreneurs that watch this and they're going to be like, OK, I'm going to go on LinkedIn and I'm going to hit up so and so once a quarter. And then I'm going to ask them for fifty thousand dollars to sponsor, <laughs> you yeah. know. So how do you kind of like recommend being authentic and, and being genuine when it's like in the back of your mind, you know that you want something right from this person, but you also know that you have to build a relationship. So how do you kind of... I think for I think for me because I get I've get I've gotten the emails ask for fifty thousand um, dollars you know I've gotten those um, you know so I so I get it and I think sometimes as a part of as a being in this position you have to anticipate that right, right. like yeah. not everybody's gonna want um, and and not and I think for me my thing has been not everybody's request is malicious some people honestly just don't know they don't they don't have yeah. the 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 acumen to know like what is the right way to approach or things of that nature but for me to be authentic for me is to be able to know exactly what I'm able to do for people um, because when you I started getting a lot of those things where people just needed something right they they just they reached out but for me it's always even if I can't do it or I can't fulfill the request always have something to say you know what I can't do it but how about this or maybe you should reach out to so and so or that's really not in my wheelhouse as mayor um, but here's the person you need to speak with so just trying to still be helpful even if you're not able to really um, build to really help them in the way that they would want to. And I think that mm -hmm. most people appreciate that um, because I'm not just saying, oh, I can't help you, you know, goodbye, good day. Um, but it's really giving them somewhere, okay, well, and, and educating them, right? Um, because the, again, people have all sorts of assumptions as a business owner, as mayor of what I can do and what I can't do. Um, and so just really helping to educate people on, okay, no, this is actually how you go about getting, getting an answer to that or getting that request fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And especially with, uh, like working with the government. So yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs fail to realize that a lot of companies, biggest client 
is the government, yeah. right? Government contracts. And I know this past week you guys had a workshop MWBE or something workshop. for mm -hmm. that. Um, but a lot of small business owners don't take advantage of that. So how important would you say is like getting those certifications, figuring out government contracting and working with your, your local government, whether it's here in Texas or, you know, wherever folks live? I think it's I think it's key. Um, one of the things we set out as a city council to do is have a 20 percent goal for all of our big projects and things that we go out for bid with minority participation. Um, that number has actually been harder to hit than we anticipated. Wow. Um, and for the, the reason being is because of the fact that we cannot necessarily claim minority participation on on a or on a business or a group that's, you know, that's doing the work, even if they even if I can look at you and tell this is minority participation they have to be certified. And so a lot of times business owners, they have, a, you know, and I can't, I can't say specifically because, you know, as to why someone really would not want to get certified, but I know sometimes it's just, again, the lack of information or feeling like it's insurmountable um, with yeah. a lot of the things and the information that they have to provide. And so, yeah. um, but it's obviously, it's, it's absolutely important to be able to get certified and have what it takes. So even if, even if the opportunities that are there now are not the opportunity for your business when the opportunity is there and presents itself you can strike while the iron is hot and you don't have yeah. to scramble trying to get your certifications and get all your stuff lined up because some of the certifications do take they do take time um, mm -hmm. and you have to have the information um, to to actually qualify and get that yeah I just went through the trademark process Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very costly. Well, not costly, but it was it was a couple yeah, couple hundred not, dollars, yeah. you know, uh, took over a year, yeah. you know. So for these certifications, I keep it's been on my to do list at least for five years. Then I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get certified. I'm going to get certified. I never do one because let's talk about these government websites. Yeah. Why? Like, why are they in 2004? <laughs> Who do I need to talk to? Who do yeah. I need to speak to? Um, but also it's that it's just intimidating. Right. So can you uh, give the folks who are watching kind of just like a quick rundown of like, OK, you know, if you want to get a certification, it's an application process. It'll take X amount of time. Like just kind of because my goal is like after this, make sure y'all drop it in the comments below. If y'all going to go get y'all certification so we could get this government money. OK, <laughs> um, so my goal is definitely to help a lot of, of our cosign community be able to get some of that funding, get, you know, get money that's out there. Sure. Now, I don't claim to be an expert on all the ways because there are so many different ways. That what you, you mean? We about, I'm about to put on my application. Mayor Rachel <laughs> said <laughs> to expedite. I know, I know to expedite it ASAP. <laughs> um, but no, I don't claim to be an expert on it. But what I will say for this um, to start. If you if if the process seems intimidating, especially because sometimes we try to zap ourselves all the way to the top and go after the multi million dollar federal government contracts, and it's just like, and that's why sometimes we get overwhelmed and we like, oh wait a minute, this is way more than I thought. But there are smaller like government, you know, typically the government in general, whether that's local, state, or federal, they have to put those things out for bid, and they have contracts on literally some sometimes for almost anything that you can think of. So again, just even thinking that oh well, my business wouldn't qualify for anything. Sometimes those contracts are far, far and few and in between. However, they do come up from time to time. So um, what I was going to say about that is that um, start small. A lot of times we give up because we try to start at the place we're designed to finish it. Like mm -hmm. I mentioned, you really try to shoot for the multi-million dollar contracts. We get overwhelmed and then we quit and we don't try again at all. But start with your local city. So like I said, DeSoto, um, what was it? DeSoto, Cedar Hill, Red Oak. Um, there was an, maybe Duncanville. There were a couple other cities we typically do things on a regional level because we can't really compete we're not dallas right um our cities are small but we've learned the power of again the relationships the partnerships and working right. together because very much so as a as a region and an economic engine our region is very powerful together so a lot of those how to work with the city um events we do them together for that reason um, and so look at each individual city's websites, your school district's websites. Mm -hmm. um, all of their bids are, are going to be posted there on their website. And what you need to do, there are things that um, there are also other websites like Bible things of that nature um, that you can actually go to and that will will kind of shoot those things out to um, so that. But there are a lot of organizations um, that deal with minority contractors to support minority contractors, because obviously we realize the sometimes it's very cumbersome, it's intimidating. But there are a lot of groups I would recommend getting connected with one of those groups first. Mm -hmm. And then they a lot of times offer help um, from that. DeSoto has even part 
partnered with uh, one of the minority councils mm -hmm. to help and give grant funding to individuals that want to get certified. Because again, we're we're struggling to meet our 20% goal because we can't really count that unless you're certified. So mm -hmm. DeSoto has some opportunities for you to even get um, grant funds to be able to pay for your certifications and things of that nature. All mm -hmm. that stuff is on our website. So I would say go to the school districts, the cities, look at their individual websites, and then start getting information from there. Yeah, perfect. I'm going to uh, make a commitment to make sure that we at CoSign figure out, make a list of resources, put yeah. it on our website um, so that folks can know. Because I do think that it's very overwhelming to figure out, like, where do I start? Where do yeah. I have to look? Especially with social media, right? It's just like, if it's not on Instagram, we half of the time, we don't even know that is going on you know yeah. I get my news on Instagram I didn't even know half of the things that are going on in Texas if you know I didn't follow certain accounts so we'll be sure to, to put that down in the show Good. notes for you guys as well so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your story so I watched a couple of your interviews um, before this in preparation and uh, one of the big things that stuck out to me was your analogy about the tour guide and the <laughs> travel agent right and uh, before we, we dive into that, I wanted to, to kind of like set the scene and set the stage that you have been very transparent in not being perfect, you know, not um, letting your your lessons or, or what some people may consider losses or drawbacks to like keep you from moving forward. And in a place where there's so many entrepreneurs who are discouraged, right, uh, the economy is not where it needs to be. Uh, people's revenue is down. We're not getting clients. Like it's hard in these streets, it's you hard. know. Um, I kind of wanted you to speak from from being, you know, in in a place that wasn't always perfect to where you are now. What are kind of the things that have um, propelled you, I guess, or like kept you going, or you know, allowed you to just keep climbing mountain after mountain? Well, at the risk of sounding like a cliche, um, my faith is like the biggest thing, right? It, everything I do rises and falls and runs through that. Like I don't do um, anything, um, you know, without like running it through that that lens, that filter. So that's one of the things that even in the hard times, like I've seen it all again, you know, with, with running businesses and just working with a family business. I mean, we have had some really, really hard times, you know? Um, and so it does take a lot to keep you in the game, even with um, public service. Like people don't realize, yeah, I'm mayor today, but I ran before and lost, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of times people don't realize like, you know, when you lose a, a, an election, you know what I'm saying? Like you can never say it didn't happen because it's, it's, it's public, public record. record. Yeah. And so when you have to take those public L's like that, I one of the things that I've learned is that you have to value the losses just as much or more than you value the wins, right? Mm. It's like, okay, what was this supposed to teach me? Because it was like, okay, God, now I, t I know you told me to run. So you had me run and lose for what? Mm -hmm. You know, like, what was what's that about? You know, and, and it really, honestly, I questioned God a lot about it. And one of the things he showed me was, is that, and this was 2019, one of the things he showed me was you were absolutely supposed to run, but it wasn't for the reason you thought you were supposed to run. Mm. And the very next year, obviously, we had COVID, right? Um, and so one of the things, there was a lot going on at that time. I won't even get into it, but I had to get out of the way. So other, sometimes we we hold up progress for other people being, being so God had to, God had to make me move because there were things when I look back on it, he was trying to get me to move around certain things and I wouldn't do it. So he, he felt like maybe this is the only way I can get her to move so she can focus on some things that I'm going to have to prepare her for, for what's to come. 2020 comes. So, you know, our family business with childcare, we were only allowed to keep kids of essential workers. Well, we went down from, you know, a couple hundred kids sometime to amount of kids you could count on one hand some days. Um, but one of the things that I, I learned through that season was I needed to be there. I needed to be all in. I needed to be present because actually that year we made more money than we had ever made ever as a business. And I don't know how I don't know how it happened. I don't know. But I know that being able to be present, being able to be there to support my staff, we didn't have to lay off any staff. People got to keep their hours. They got to come to work. Their jobs look different every day because kids right. were not there, but they got to keep their job. And mm -hmm. that was what was important to me. These people, you know, a lot of them have been with us, have been with us 5, 10, 15 years, some of them. And so to be able to um, just 
have whatever we needed to do to go all in to make sure we salvage that was obviously what God wanted me to be in a position to be able to focus on for that time in mm -hmm. that season. Mm -hmm. Would you say uh, that was one of like your biggest L's or, or what do you consider to be like your biggest L to date? You know what? I'm going to I'm going to take that back and say that. In hindsight, they were all W's, right? Mm. Because it was what I was, it's, it's what I needed to grow. Mm. A lot of times, some of the things we looked at as L's were things that were also things that were keeping us comfortable. Um, and so again, we had to, I, they had to be taken away because this is the only way I can get you to move into the real thing that I need you to be doing. So I, again, I, I looked at them as, okay, what was I supposed to be learning? Yeah, I'm mad in the moment. I'm human. Like, you know, you're, you're, you feel some type of way because it's not what you thought it was supposed to be. But, um, mm -hmm. as, as you can see, what's for you will always find you, right? Like it always comes back around. And when it comes back around and when the timing is right, you're going to know you're going to have peace around that being, this is the time, right? God mm -hmm. is going to make that, make that very apparent. And, and this time around, it was right. It was what I needed to do. Because I think if, if I had gotten, if I had gotten what I wanted at that time, I don't know if we would have been able to really um, do a lot of the things that we're doing now in terms of even the community being ready for it, right? Like, it's just not about me being excited and me having all these great ideas. The community has to be ready. The staff has to be ready. Your right. council people have to be ready. Everybody had, the time just has to be right. And so I think that with those things, even things I looked at as a loss in that moment really weren't a loss. It was what I needed to prepare me and set me up to be able to do those things. And I think those are the things that grow you up. A lot of times people, entrepreneurs, they see, and it's really unfortunate because a lot of times we see where people like yourself, other people are now, but we don't realize all of the stuff. I tell people the real work happens offline, y'all. Like I'm probably in more meetings and doing more things that the public will never, ever see. So sometimes mm -hmm. people discount the work that we really do as their elected officials and their representatives and even in entrepreneurship, because when we're really, you know, getting into it, it's not the the sexy stuff that you want to post online and it doesn't make for real good reels. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like those types of things. Um, you have to really help people that want to be helped in terms of when I provide mentorship to entrepreneurs, like this is not for the faint at heart. You know, you really got to be ready to put in the work girl and take everything that come with it because it's all, it's, it's a package <laughs> deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I love how you say, you know, that it's kind of like everything ends up becoming a W because like what you're able to learn from it. And one thing that I realized is like a lot of times I'm in rooms and entrepreneurs ask me, well, like, how did you get this and how do you get that? And I'm like, the Lord. Yeah. You know how I know it was the Lord? Because I'm unqualified. Yeah. I have no business so, being in this room. No right. Yeah. Literally, like one of the opportunities that I recently got, um, the my counterparts in other cities are love and hip hop reality stars, like world famous DJs, whatever. And it's like, I'm just a regular girl with a couple yeah. thousand followers. Like, how did I end up here? And it was like, God was setting me up for something else, you know? And I think often times, like you were saying in some other interviews about like being uh, the tour guy, like oftentimes we don't realize like a lot of the things that we're experiencing is because we're gonna take other people through that same experience yeah. as well. So for those uh, who aren't familiar with that analogy, go ahead and kind of like share your your thesis on, <laughs> on the tour guide and the travel agent. So I, and this is really more so for leadership in general, right? A lot of times um, people are like, well, what do I do? I don't, I don't know what I should be doing, my idea, my focus, because I like everything, right? Um, but I always say that um, you want to be a tour guide. And so what does that mean? Well, I'll start with the travel agent. Right. If we've ever had a travel agent, um, you know, a travel agent is somebody that you're going to go to when you want to take a trip somewhere. They're going to find you. They're going to book everything. They're going to, you know, get you the right prices, get all those things. And they're sending you places that they themselves oftentimes have never been. So when you get to that place, there's still a chance when you get to the to the to the island or wherever you're at. If you don't have anybody there to guide you through where you're at, you can still get lost. You may, you know, whatever, all the things you won't know where to go or just all those things. So the, the travel agent is the person that really sends you places that they themselves have no frame of reference for. Um, you see a lot of that. Right. You see a lot of experts. I mean, it's we 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 all know them. Right. Um, you see a lot of experts that are really kind of just regurgitating information, but it's not really from a place of actually knowing, right? Um, but then you have a tour guide, and if you've ever been on a trip and you've had an amazing tour guide, 
you know, that's the person that's out front, right? They're out front and they're telling you all the things that are happening. They're telling you the history of the place you are. Um, they're guiding you through those things. And they're always mm -hmm. out front and they're taking you through a place that they themselves have been through time and time again. So they know it like the back of their hand. They could tell you about it in their sleep, all those things. And when you have a really great tour guide, you feel safer because you know that the person that's leading you out front mm -hmm. has experience for this and they know that. Um, they know that place that they are taking you to and through. And so I always tell people, be the tour guide, like use those things that you have been through. God never wastes anything that we've been through. And I always tell people, mm -hmm. especially those that want to be consultants or coaches to do some kind of service based business to start with. Um, generally, the people we are called to serve are usually some previous version of ourself, right? And so what was the system that you went through to get that? Even if it was getting out of a toxic relationship and you got out of it with your peace of mind and all the things you needed to do, to be healthy and whole on the other side of it. Like what steps did you go through that you could actually take somebody else through? Um, and so that's what I tell people, like look at the look at the system and what you went through and duplicate that for people and help people to actually get a result. People don't actually want the thing you're selling. They want the result of the thing you're selling. Mm -hmm. So like how can you actually monetize the system you went through or the framework you went through? I always tell people if you're looking to get into entrepreneurship, you know, you can aspire to a lot of things, but start with like a high level skill you have that you can actually walk that, that that eliminates a lot of overhead all those things and you can actually bring in your profit margins generally higher if you can charge the right price you know for mm -hmm. that service or for that um for that framework that you're giving to people and help coach and walk people through that so that's really what i i stand on it's like be a tour guide we have enough travel agents out here on in these internet streets and everywhere else um that are really leading people to nowhere Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and getting paid good money to do it, <laughs> you know, but like be a tour guide and really help um, be out front and guide people to help people's lives better through what you've been through. Mm -hmm. Oh, so much to unpack there. As you were talking and you were mentioning, um, you know, like skill sets and stuff like that. And a lot of people regurgitating information. It's gotten so hard to be a service based entrepreneur, to be a coach, to be any type of information entrepreneur now because we have artificial intelligence. Right. So I can go on chat GPT and ask them, how do I run a daycare? And now I can get on Instagram five steps to opening a successful daycare in Texas. Yeah. N no experience. Right. I'm it's giving travel agent energy. Right. <laughs> like I can convince you that I know where you need to go, what you need to do. But I've never actually been there. I've never actually experienced it. So now as we see workforces evolving, you know, business evolving with like these new tools for artificial intelligence, how, how are you feeling about like that new landscape or, or how are you considering that now, you know, as you develop and grow? I'll say Honestly, I have, Emily, this is just my observation and I could be wrong because I don't claim to have just really researched it, but I don't see artificial intelligence taking off like we thought it was going to in terms of just like taking over, right? Mm -hmm. However, what I do see and what I hope to see more of is that people becoming friends with AI versus looking at it as their competition or a thing mm -hmm. that's going to eliminate their job, right? Um, it's like really seeing how can we use this as a tool in our business versus it taking over our business. Because what I also do see, and, and, and you know, I made, I, I kind of said it jokingly, but I think, I think our audiences, because we've seen the five steps to this and the tips and tricks and the tools and the hacks so much, people is kind of starting to go in one ear and out the other. And people are getting more sophisticated mm -hmm. in terms of they can snuff out a lot of fake and phony. And, and a lot of it is just really eliminating itself on its own. Because again, once you get, try to, you can't really scale that and you can't take it to the next level, right? So a lot of those, those people are starting to weed themselves out. But I really see more people trying to utilize it and to help improve the efficiency and just the speed at which we do things, especially as service-based um, entrepreneurs, because a lot of times time is is of the essence when we're, mm -hmm. when we're serving people. So I'm seeing a lot more of that um, as we continue to, like you said, this landscape is starting to really evolve. Yeah. I really consider you to be uh, like a visionary. Like I really feel like you can see things that other people don't see. Would you agree? Do, do you I consider do. that? Mm -hmm. um, so as you, and I know you say that you love market research, right? Like that's like your market research junkie. So give us a little, a little future forecast, right? Like where do you see yourself, um, you know, the city of DeSoto, your career, like, you know, in the next five, 10 years, like what's your legacy going to look like? Wow. Um, 
I really, um, I, you know, and I always say that I'm just kind of, and I'm not a go with the flow type person, but there is a part of me that's just like, okay, I'm open for whatever, right? Like I'm going to plan, I'm going to, you know, try to see, see what I would like to see, but I also leave room for God to say, no, I, I kind of want you here. Mm -hmm. So for me, I don't, you know, people always like, well, what next office are you going to run for? I don't know. You know, like I, and I, I'm seriously, I seriously don't know. But, um, in terms of DeSoto, I think for me, um, DeSoto is a place that obviously I love, right? It's been my home for as long as, you know, as long as I can remember. And one of the things that I really see for our community is a lot of things that we're doing now, right? We're, we're doing a lot of planning and setting a lot of foundational things because when we talk about um, like the economic investment and, and a lot of the things we don't have in our communities, there are some systemic things that go with that. So I'm not negating that, but I won't, but for the sake of this, this point, I think some of the things that we had not done well in our community um, is, is planning and vision. Like where does all these businesses we say we want to see, where do they go? Right. If the product is not there, if the real estate is not there, where do they actually go? How do we do that? So we've been doing what we call the Hampton Road Redevelopment Project, which is essentially creating more of a downtown in our city. Um, it's that one mile stretch of, of, of Hampton Road that we're going to be doing um, and, and really creating a more of a destination site and a walkable pedestrian friendly area. So if you're familiar here in Dallas, we have like the Bishop Arts District. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a, an area. DeSoto is still very much so a bedroom community, meaning it's not a big urban, you know, type of a feel there with big skyscrapers. It's still a bedroom community. We don't want to lose that aspect of it, but we do want to elevate it just a little bit. And so with that project, um, we're looking to create space for, again, our entrepreneurs and people that have businesses, we've actually been, um, we have a few projects that are coming online with um, celebrity chef Tiffany Derry. She's putting one of her concepts. Uh, she's going to be one of the first to go in our Hampton Road redevelopment. We've been working with her. And, and I always say that, you know, a lot of the development, cities don't develop cities, right? Developers develop cities. So again, you have to go back to the relationships that you're building with developers um, and people that, um, that can actually bring you what you want. And so mm -hmm. we've been kind of doing what I call hand-to-hand -hand combat and having meetings uh, and bringing people in, showing them the vision so that they can actually see it, um, who DeSoto wants to be when we grow up. And when people, people, you know, get excited when they can see that you have a very clear vision um, mm -hmm. and they can see where they can fit into that vision. So that's what we've been very intentional about in our city and our community. And that's what I want to be a part of my legacy is really bringing, um, bringing, just bringing what people want to see so they don't have to go outside of their mm -hmm. city to live, work and play. Yeah. Yeah. And personally for you, what are so we know we don't we don't know if, you, if politics is, is going to keep it? on going, but your your franchisee. Oh, right? absolutely. So business is, is it not more going franchises? Anywhere. Is it is there other businesses that you want to like branch off into things that you have your kind of like your eye on? So I'm, I'm going to I'm all in with, like I said, with my franchise right now um, for the time being. So that's that's going to be a thing. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for that in terms of the area um, to really expand and grow that from from that aspect. Um, another thing that I really love is real estate. So I want to get more, um, really take more time to start getting back into that. There was a time when I was really heavy into it and, and doing those things. So like branching off into not just like um, duplexes, stuff like that, but getting into like, a, you know, multifamily, things of that nature um, and just kind of trying my hand at that. Um, so that's one thing I know for sure from a business aspect that I'll be looking at. I'm so excited. Okay, Mayor Rachel Turn, De Mayor uh, Developer Rachel. We're trying to do all the things. We're trying to get every get everything that um you know that that's out there for us. So I mean, you know, in terms of building building wealth, and I, and a lot of stuff is buzzwords, and you know, we we hear all the things about wealth building and legacy building, things of that nature. But that's something that I re is really important to me yeah. is um being able to um being able to to build that wealth and really understanding what that means. You know, it's not about having a lot of money in the bank, you know, and all right. of those things, but really um, going out there and seizing those opportunities that everybody else is taking advantage of. So why not me? Right, exactly. Especially like as small business owners and entrepreneurs, we have to think about like what, where are the opportunities and like what is at my disposal? So like, for example, when I first moved to Dallas, I knew I wanted an investment property. So I leaned on my realtor and I was like, well, you know, what's up, what's yeah. coming? She was like, South Dallas. I went on the city website and I found out that in the Fair Park area, there was like a multi-million dollar contract to like redo that part of South yeah. Dallas. 
I bought three years ago, like my house has basically almost doubled in equity, right? But oftentimes we're not thinking about, well, what cities are getting developed? What areas of my city are getting right. developed? We like, oh, we just, let's just hop on Instagram. But there's just so much money, like you said, in real life, in real relationships, in uh physical locations, you know, where you're at that I think, uh, and I want a lot of folks that are listening to this um, to, you know, write it down. If your business in DeSoto, baby, you might have to go get in the corridor. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you said something that was that like struck a chord with me about um, vision, right? Because a lot of people, um, they, when you really understand what vision is, it's about seeing it before you can see it, yeah. right? Like you said, you went to South Dallas, got the information, looked at where things were coming. But so many of us want the immediate mm -hmm. that we a lot of times overlook opportunities like that um, because we want something immediate. Well, I want it now. I don't want to wait till, you know, this comes and that comes. But really understanding the um, in business and especially in real estate, um, delayed gratification, right? And being, again, intentional, being savvy, doing your research about what are the up and coming areas and, and what's coming that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's huge. Like you gotta really, you know, it's, it's a long game. Like we, again, we wanna start at this place and we wanna be, you know, the next, whoever, you know, you look at in that aspect, but it's like, you gotta, you gotta be intentional. You gotta have patience. You gotta be smart about it. Um, and, and, you know, the opportunities will come. Yeah. What is the one, I guess, one key thing that you would say to entrepreneurs who are watching this, it could be a tip, like how to grow your business. It could be a motivational reminder, but what do you think is like one thing that entrepreneurs need to know right now? Oh, my brain just went a couple places. Mm. I would say, because not once in our whole conversation, like I talk to a lot of people about business and it's always like, be consistent, post consistently on Instagram, network. Like, you know, it's always like you know all now that I generic foolery. <laughs> but for you, like, what do you think? Because I think you have a very uh, different perspective, right, than most mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. So I want to know, like, as OG, like, what do we need to know? I think, I think we need to get back to the basics in business. You know, there are a few key metrics that are going to drive and make or break you in business. And I think we've gotten so engrossed in online business, which is great. I'm, I'm going to give my, I'm going to cut my piece of the pie too with online business. We've gotten so engrossed that we think that that is business, that that is entrepreneurship. When you have, like I said, when you have real estate, when you have stocks, you have all these things that are so, you know, the traditional, like things that are always, I'm, I live a very principled life, right? Like there are just some things that by principle and by nature of law, like these things are going to happen. And so I'm very traditional. And if I could, honestly, if I could get offline and not have, and, and be okay, I would not be online because there is so much money to be made. There is so much business to be done offline. I think we get so caught up with what's happening online and trying to have our brand and all these things. Like just do some stuff that's we that's been proven that's that works, you know, things of that nature. And so just stick with the basics of business. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like you you gotta you gotta be able, you gotta know what you're gonna sell, right? You gotta be able to sell it. Be authentic, be genuine, be truthful, be honest, right? Don't don't be out here pushing stuff that you know you don't really know or you just regurgitating or you you swipe from somewhere else. But I think when you really get into those basics, um, that will come out in the wash. Like, mm -hmm. you know, either you, you know, you, 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 you'll find out what you're made of from that aspect. Yeah. I was about to wrap this up, but I'm going to reel it back in real quick. Sure. I know that you had uh, had this period of time, like a period of stillness, where you had like six months where you were trying to like redo your website and do all this stuff. And you were like, I'm just going to sit down, be quiet, get on social media and just take a month to myself. And that really was able to like propel your business forward. Can you talk a little bit about that um, point in time of stillness? Because I think so many of us don't want to be forgotten, right? We want to stay top of mind. We need to stay, you know, we need to keep shaking hands. We need to keep making money. And it's like, we're burnt out trying to be on that hamster wheel. So what has stillness, you know, brought you and still been able to be oh, successful? Yeah. I think, um, well, I think, I think people, I think when, if you've ever been in a person's heart and in, in someone's mind in a genuine way, or if you've ever helped somebody, people don't, if you've really helped somebody, people don't easily forget you. Right. They're they're just waiting on you. That Like when I when I came back, people are like, oh, we you know, we good. We, we were all right. You know, we're going to be all right. But I think for me, 
getting still and really taking some time to really back away to figure out, okay, what, what am I doing with this? What is, what's really going on was important for me because it was able to, um, to show me a lot of times that it really does not take all of that, that we do. A lot of times we get to, to burn ourselves out because again, I think this was probably, I think you're speaking of probably during like the pandemic season. Mm -hmm. Um, to where, you know, I was really able to really, again, get back to the basics. Like, what are the basics that I need to do? Like bare level minimum, what, you know, and I realized that a lot of things that I was holding as kind of like cordial law really weren't even necessary to me being successful. And so I think that people were able to get the best of me when I step, took a step back to take care of me. So it was like, you know, I was trying to, you know, give everybody, give, 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 give. And eventually I was pouring from an empty cup, right? right. Instead of pouring from the overflow. Yeah. And I think that when I was able to take a step back and fill myself up, truly fill myself up and allow myself to heal in a lot of areas, because even during that season, um, there were a lot of things that I realized I had not dealt with. And so you know, again, kind of going back to my faith, I think that what you believe in terms of your core values, in terms of your faith, all of those things impact every area of your life. Like you cannot compartmentalize your life at all, right? Like yeah. if you have unforgiveness or if you're hurt or if you're damaged in a certain area, it's absolutely going to show itself in other areas of your life. And it may not manifest itself in the same way in all of those areas, but it all boils back down to the fact of, you know, what's really in my heart, you know, how am I feeling? How am I doing? And if you don't ever take a step back to really check in on yourself and I don't even think, you know, I think you, you should do it periodically, but at least take a time, you know, to where you kind of step back. Because for me, I had gotten too caught up in both the criticism and the clapping. Right. Mm. So it's like you, but you can't take, you know, cause people will hail you one day and nail you the next. Right. So you can't get really caught up in either one of them in terms of people hyping you up and gassing you up. That's fine if they do. Accept it. Love it. And you also cannot get caught up in the criticism. Um, you know, one day I had to just sit and tell myself, Rachel, why in the world are you taking stuff personal from a bunch of people that don't even know you personally? Right. Like so you have to really figure out who you are, what you stand for, know who you are, because, again, at the end of the day, not to say it doesn't matter. Um, cause there are some cr criticism, maybe you need to consider it. Right. But you can't get too caught up in it. Mm -hmm. Um, because either way, you know, it can cause you to not really just, you know, it can, it can sway you a lot of times. So you really got to know who you are. And I know for me taking that step back and being able to see, okay, this is what, this is, this is who I am. This is what I need to do. This is what I need to work on. Take some time away. And then come back um, was was a game changer for me. Yeah, yeah. Come on, criticism and clapping. Yes, listen. Look, write that down. Will. Write that down. <laughs> so before this turns into a masterclass, and we're here till tomorrow, let the folks know how they can keep up with you, everything you have going on. Sure. Um, I don't know if you're still taking clients, but just just let the folks know what's next for you. Absolutely. So um, the easiest way to keep up with me on social is probably through my Instagram. Uh, I'm on probably all of the uh, all of the the Instagram. I mean, excuse me, the social media channels at uh, Rachel. L Proctor, so that L is not Rochelle. That's a <laughs> that's my middle initial. People call me Raquel, Rochelle. I'm like y'all. It's Rachel. That's my middle initial. But um, Rachel L Proctor, you can always find me there. Um, my website rachellproctor.com or rachelfordesoto.com uh, are ways to keep up with me, and um, I usually respond back pretty quick. Awesome. We look forward to seeing you at the Cosign Awards. Yes. So if you haven't gotten your tickets, make sure y'all get that. And we'll hear a lot more from Ray Rachel soon, huh? Yes, absolutely. I'm excited. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Thank you for the interview. It was great. Yay.